Hi everyone, welcome to this edition of Engineering Q&A. I'm joined this time by two representatives from our Department of Agricultural and Biological Engineering, which is actually co-located in the College of Engineering and the College of Agriculture. Um, I have two professors with us, so I'll have them introduce themselves. Hello, welcome to uh, um, this episode and thank you for taking the time to learn a little bit more about agricultural engineering. My name is John Lumpkus, I'm a professor in agricultural engineering. Uh, my area of specialty is machine systems engineering, which we'll talk about in a little uh, in a little while. Agricultural engineering has both a long and important history. Uh, since uh, the beginning of time, we've needed to have food to eat and uh, managing our resources water. We also have an uh, exciting future. We are published at the um, we are positioned at the intersection of food, water, energy, and our environment. In our machine systems engineering concentration, or MSE. Our students look at machines from a systems perspective, and the question we ask is how machines can be used or need to be used in the future to sustainably support a growing population. Uh, and then we're also joined here by Professor McMillan. Do you want to introduce yourself in your field? Sure, thank you. Um, my name is Sarah McMillan. I am an associate professor in environmental and natural resources engineering. Um, I would say that the environmental and natural resources engineering degree, it focuses on protecting and restoring natural ecosystems. So those might be land, water, or air resources. Um, many of our students come to this program because they have an interest in restoring or conserving landscapes that improve um, the environment, not only for humans to live healthy and sustainable lives, but also ensure safe and sustainable food production for in both rural and urban areas, actually, and also to ensure that we have ecological habitats to support wildlife or other water quality and water quantity kinds of um, uses. So our students, they work with nature to design solutions such as pollution from into lake systems or flooding in rivers um, and using those natural systems to kind of build and, and understand their designs. So our students take courses in computational um, engineering disciplines such as, um, you know, kind of programming and physics and chemistry and all of those types of courses. But they also take courses in the natural system. So things like soil science so that when they build their designs, they're working connected systems that that think about problem solving from a really quantitative perspective but work with the land and the water systems that they're trying to protect and restore all right makes sense so let's dive into these fields a little bit more um, professor lumpkus what are some of the things that are unique about the agricultural engineering program and then the machine systems engineering field within that that's a great question thank you our machine systems engineering, uh, I would say, is unique in how it brings together mechanical, electrical, environmental, and agricultural uh, systems to provide solutions to our both current challenges, which are in the news, but also the upcoming future challenges. This might mean improving, say, current machines for the production, transportation, and preparation of our food, or if we look to the future, developing new autonomous food production systems. That might include things like robotics, um, big data from a system of sensors, say monitoring environmental systems, tractors have sensors on them, trucks, um, UAVs, satellites. So we gather data from a lot of different places, but what we aim to do is how do we make that data useful and the machines that are going to interact and actually allow that data to make um, something useful on the ground. So in other words, machine system students, I would say, are prepared to design machines that allow data to make a difference on the grounds, or in many cases, literally in the ground. Our plan of study includes foundational courses, which are going to be similar to the other disciplines in statics, dynamics, materials, uh, machine design. Uh, we include then electrical um, courses like circuits and sensors, design of electronic systems. But what makes us unique then is our course is focused on things like properties of biological materials. So in addition to a metals based course, our students take a course on the material properties for biological systems. Um, they also take soils and water courses which overlap with our environmental program and specialty courses like the design of off highway vehicles. And my understanding is that the agricultural engineering program has a pretty small size of students in it. What are some of the advantages uh, that that might bring for the students that do ch choose to major in agricultural engineering? Um, 
So our, the way our courses are set up, we encourage the um, interaction with students. Um, students are in the same class size generally. We have one section of each course. Um, we uh, have a, a, every, I'm sorry, I'm going to study. But that every uh, AB course that we teach has a lab affiliated with it. So there's a lot of interaction with their students. Um, there's a, a resource rooms where the students will get together and study. So I think the camaraderie in the program is um, something our students always highlight of how much fun it is to be a part of. Um, our students will spontaneous host events themselves to get together and do things. If I'm leaving the building late at night and I see 15 or 20 of our students in a room all together, I know there's an exam the next day and they're having a organic study group. And that's pretty typical of, of the, the, the intentionality of a program to do that, but then also the size of a program that allows us to do that. Nice. Uh, camaraderie sounds really cool in the program. Definitely one of the benefits of, of smaller class sizes. Uh, Professor McMillan, coming to you, what are some of the unique things about ENRE, Environmental Natural Resources Engineering? Um, what might draw students to the program and what do you see as some of the, the real benefits for the students that are in it? Okay. <laughs> so some of the things that I think I highlighted in the description are really some of the things that students are drawn to. So I kind of stated that many of our students come to this program to really want to understand how environmental problems are solved from a large scale. They have really strong passions for thinking about livability of cities or sustainable food production or climate change or growing populations. And so they're really coming to our program with these big questions and wanting to solve them. And I think the skills that our students gain allow them to do really detailed problem solving skills. So like Dr. Lomka said, our students take courses in very fundamental engineering disciplines so that they build that foundation that's really strong. And then they are allowed courses in water quantity, water quality, soil science, so that they are allowed to then think about how these different engineering design principles and problem solving skills can be used to interact with the natural environment. So um, our students allow are, are doing very diverse kinds of things. This is a relatively interdisciplinary space, but many of the um, unique things that, that Dr. Lumkis mentioned about um, class size and things like that are, are very common to both of the programs and I think that that part of it is a really big benefit. I would also say a lot of our students um, take advantage of the connectedness with the College of Agriculture and the College of Engineering to think about minors and different um, places where they might be able to enhance whatever it is that they really want to do. So some will go and get a sustainability certificate because they're really interested in understanding maybe sustainability from a company or an industry perspective. Or they might go get a plant science minor so that they can understand how plants can be used in restoring ecosystems like wetlands or um, rivers or something like that. So um, there's a lot of opportunity for you to kind of make your, your, your um, path your own. And I think that provides some um, flexibility, but also some real intentionality of what we're trying to teach our students about that natural systems and how they work from site scales up to big, big watershed scales. So one of the questions I always like to ask each of our departments and majors are, what are some of the internship and research opportunities for students in these departments? So Professor Lumpkis, do you want to talk a little bit about some of the research and internship opportunities that some of the students you've known have had during their undergraduate time at Purdue? Yes, thank you. I'd uh, love to. So we both emphasize, um, encourage, and try to enable opportunities for all of our students to get practical experience. And, and that could be internships. It could be undergraduate research in the summer. It could be a mix of both. Uh, our students are successful at getting internships and then also getting return invitations. And so it's common that our students might do all three summers um, at the same company and then start with three years of uh, credit to them when they work at the company. They might do three different ones because they want to experiment with different companies and different cultures. Uh, they might do undergrad research and then go to an industry and work. But regardless of what they want to do, we'll work with them to do that. Um, I think what a unique part about our program because of their experience while they're a student here is our alumni will frequently email back to us directly and say, uh, Professor Lumpkis, I'm looking for a student. Do you have anyone you could recommend to me personally? 
and we'll get emails asking for um, students to apply to a position uh, from our program. The students come back, they um, get engaged with recruitment. So it's, it's fun at things like the career fair to see our students back recruiting other students. And so they stay engaged when they're at the companies. Um, our placement is very high with that. And I think the hands-on labs um, help out a lot. The student projects we'll talk about later that they get a chance to get hands-on to helps get experience during the school year that the industries are looking for for internships and for employment. Uh, Professor McMillan, how about for environmental and natural resources engineering? What are some of the internship and research opportunities that those students have? Sure. I, um, I actually have a lot of undergraduates in my own lab personally, so I think this is an easy thing for us to share details about. And I'm not alone. Many of us do bring students into the labs and into our field research programs or even our computational research programs during the school year. And we encourage students to do that because a lot of times internships over the summer take them away and give them that valuable um, professional experience, but it's difficult and some students don't particularly um, have the opportunity to take a co-op where they're gone for an entire period of time. So research in the in the school year allows them to build additional skills that are applying what they've learned in the classroom to, to gain that, that kind of experience. Um, some of the types of things they might do is working with the um, field and or um, kind of data collection where they work and they go out to the sites and they collect soils and they learn skills about what is that data that they're seeing in their either their problem assignment or their, their data come across their desk at an internship, how did that data get collected? And so I think that's a really important piece of what these internships and research experiences allow students to do is kind of connect what's actually happening, how that data makes its way into a problem. So they also deal with kind of um, real world messy situations. So data isn't always clean. And so when you get a sensor like John was talking about regarding um, monitoring temperature in a, in a field or soil moisture in the, in the um, in the ground in a, in a field or somewhere else, um, those data aren't always cleaned up nicely for you like they are in a homework assignment, right? And so they understand kind of how to go about that. So I think that's pretty great experience that they get. Um, yeah, I can talk a little bit more about internships, but a lot of the things that Dr. Lumpkis said about our students going out into industry and getting kind of repeat requests is really common in the environmental natural resources side too. We have a great network of, of um, alumni and consulting companies that do things like ecological restoration of wetlands and rivers or do kind of site planning and, and understanding river flow and things like that. So a lot of those uh, alumni are participating in our capstone senior design process. They're participating in career fairs and they're actively sending me and others emails. Hey, I have projects. Do you have students that you would like to recommend? And many times our students go and talk with our alumni and they, they help them on the path. So there's a lot of mentoring too with that connection. I think our smaller program allows our alumni to stay really connected to our students. And I think that's been a really great benefit to many of them. Yeah, definitely sounds like. So agricultural and biological engineering is actually co-located in the College of Ag and the College of Engineering, which is pretty unique. How does that work for on the student's end? Does that add any confusion or does it have some benefits for the students? Would um, either of you want to talk about that? And to, uh, I'll add on to what Dr. McMillan said. I think yeah. there's many aspects which it benefits. Um, for me also in, in the faculty, which impacts the students, there's benefits as well because of their contacts and interfaces between the two colleges that trickles down to the students or classes, or if they're asking, you know, someone doing work in this area, it's kind of two big uh, pots of, of research and activities going on that we can tap into. For the students personally, um, scholarships is a big one. So the College of Agriculture has its um, pool of scholarships, the College of Engineering does, our, our students are eligible for both and they often take advantage of both. Um, I think the intersection point hits home in our own department. We have a very, very high level of scholarships and most students that apply get a scholarship um, for agricultural and biological engineering that are often funded by our alumni. Um, in some cases by uh, current professors will support scholarships for our own department um, and our um, uh, company sponsors will also sponsor scholarships. And so our, our scholarship levels are very high. 
Uh, study abroad is another one. So our, our students will partake in uh, study abroad offerings through College of Engineering or through College of Ag. Um, in my own case, as an example, on a leader, I lead both programs through the College of Engineering. So my uh, service learning projects in, in the last two years in Kenya, before that in Cameroon, are offered through Global Engineering Programs and Partnerships in College of Engineering. Um, I was going to be offering an Ireland one through the College of Ag this past spring break, which got canceled along, which was a good choice, it turned out. Um, and so I've offered other ones, and sometimes they're joint ones. I'll have College of Ag students and College of Engineering students participate on those projects um, because of the linkages between the two colleges. Um, and then you get the clubs, you get the leadership activities, um, ambassadors, a lot of different ways for students to get involved in both. Um, so I would say, if anything, um, it's maybe overwhelming the number of choices, but the benefits are, are very good and taken advantage of by our students. Some students have an affinity towards one or the other and they take advantage of that, but it gives them another chance to get connected with the university. You also have some exciting stuff coming up. We have a new building that's currently being uh, renovated as well as expanded upon. Um, does anybody want to talk about that? Some of the new facilities you guys are getting? Sure, I'll start and then John, you can jump in. Does that sound great? Yes. Yeah, so we um, have, this has been a long time coming um, in some ways, but also it's been happening really quickly over this past year, seeing the, the uh, building rise out of a big hole in the ground. Um, we're gonna have some amazing research spaces, but also some really fantastic teaching spaces. Um, each of the floors in our new space will have a maker space dedicated to undergraduates where they can go in and manipulate materials, build things with 3D printers, connect with each other in these organic kind of study groups or tinkering sessions for clubs that we do. Um, so those things are really gonna be fantastic. Lots and lots of spaces where students can connect with each other and with their faculty mentors so that they can have that common space to, to build those connections with each other. Um, the facilities are gonna be really a great asset, I think, in terms of giving us ability to do more hands-on labs. All of our classes, in fact, now have hands-on laboratories associated with them. I don't know that we brought that up just yet. And sometimes that requires us to share spaces with other departments or to take our stuff outside or to go down to a, a, another facility we have on campus for some of those. It'll be great for all of that to be under one roof and for students to have a lot more access um, um, to some of those, those materials and those experiences. So I'll let John um, add to anything that he feels I would like to add to. No, that was a great summary. The, the way it would illustrate it is we had two years of planning and it was so encouraging to hear all the faculty as we plan on how we were going to make sure the undergraduate student population was integrated into the building, had access, um, that they were part of the, the research um, opportunities, that they had their own maker space, that they had meeting space. Um, I think it's going to really reflect that when we get into the new building. I'm um, getting all of our faculty under one roof with our students and um, uh, yeah, I, I mean, I'm super excited. I mean, I still go by the building. And I can't believe that that'll be ours. Yeah. Uh, hopefully sooner than later, but uh, it's, it's, it's very exciting. So the last couple of questions I, I want to ask you all are maybe some of the differences between some of the other majors in engineering that may sound a little similar. So for Professor Lumpkus, um, you know, you specialize in machine systems engineering. How does that differ a little bit from mechanical engineering? Are they at all similar? What, which one, you know, might be a better fit for what kind of student? Yeah, we, we do get that question. Um, and our goal really in describing the differences is to let students make the choice that fits them best. I think when students find a place they are connected into the department and engaged in the activities of the department, they're gonna be the successful students that we, that all the departments wanna have on campus. Um, I think the uniqueness for our department is there's the foundational courses, which in many, many cases, well, several cases are mechanical engineering courses. So for example, statics dynamics are taken through mechanical engineering as can be the fluids and some other courses. Um, but then when you get into the materials course, we have the, metal, the metals course that other material engineering students or mechanical engineering students would take. Then we have our unique courses like the principles of biological materials. So if you're looking at a 
a corn stalk or a stem or a tree, what are the properties of a living or biological material? So it's still very similar in stress strain, but it's unique to us because we're working with those materials in our food, um, fiber uh, production, energy systems, um, anything that, that's related to biological materials. And so that's one example of being unique. Our machine design courses will emphasize a little bit more of the heavy equipment industry. Um, a lot of our students that go to work for the, the companies you would expect to like John Deere, Caterpillar, Case New Holland do um, do like the fact that we have a design of off-highway machinery course where it's not, it's the traditional mechanical engine propulsion drive lines, but then we look at the tire soil interaction in the course and traction models and friction of actually driving through, through different soil types, soil compaction and the environmental impact of soil compaction. Um, and, and so that, that emphasis makes it unique with along with some of the College of Ag courses that our students also take by being a College of Ag student. And then Professor McMillan, how about you? We have, you're obviously in environmental natural resources engineering. We also have the um, environmental and ecological engineering major in engineering. How do those two programs differ and also which one might attract to which sort of student? Thanks for that question, because we do get it a lot. And it's it's challenging in some ways, because I would say that if we're a Venn diagram, we have a, a decent amount of overlap. But the focus of our and expertise of our faculty are definitely in the land, water, uh, environmental, natural system space. So the word of natural resources in our title really builds on the fact that we are working in ecological systems that are in our natural environments. We're working on land and water resources, soil resources. Um, I would say that we're doing less in treatment plants, but that isn't unheard of for our students to work in that space. But a lot of the designs that they're building are things and the expertise that they gain are things that are related to these larger scale systems. So conserving and restoring um, sites, things like stormwater design practices in a city or conservation practices in an agricultural system, restoring and maintaining um, and minimizing bank erosion in a stream or a river, um, things about how do you think about a watershed and minimizing flooding from using models that help us predict water flow through a uh, channel network, right? So there's lots of ways in which our students are taking those same fundamental engineering principles and then thinking about treatment and designs for water pollution or water quantity, so to minimize things like flooding, um, but using natural systems and larger landscape features to do that. So for example, we have a senior design team right now working on a channel restoration project where they're using natural channel design principles such as um, wood and other things to be able to um, really stabilize that stream bed and then that kind of design rather than maybe thinking about designing a, a treatment plant that would improve water quality at the source of where you might like come for drinking water and things like that. So I think there's a lot of overlap. A lot of students are really interested in ecological engineering things related to conserving and restoring these natural systems. Um, I think the interface with food production is pretty helpful because our students increasingly recognize that global changes, climate change, growing populations are, are really putting a strain on our food production systems. And so figuring out how to do that in a sustainable way is really important. Um, as far as classes go, our students um, are, I said this a little bit earlier, but our students take things like soil science and agronomy, um, and then they take some soil and water conservation engineering courses in our department, uh, water quality and or restoration courses in our department so that they get that foundation that they, that they need and then can apply it as they move forward. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Well, thanks for that overview to both of you. Um, what are some of the clubs and student organizations that um, your students have been involved in that re relate to agricultural engineering or environmental natural resources engineering? I'll go ahead and get started because my, I think there's a lot more uh, clubs and, and some really great stuff on the machine system side to give John enough time to do that. But um, the ENRE side, our students do a lot within other environmental clubs on campus. So they do connect outside of our program, which allows them that connectedness throughout the College of Ag or the College of Engineering. But one I'd like to highlight is our ASABE club, which is a number of letters, but 
it's basically our professional society. Um, and the students this year organized a really um, innovative and, and awesome way of connecting to World Water Day. So World Water Day is an international celebration that happened at the end of March. And with everything going on, they had to take all of their um, interactive and um, in-person activities and move them virtual. Um, they worked not only with ASAP Club, but other environmental clubs on campus to do so. And they've done an incredible job of doing a series of podcasts, um, uh, social media stuff. So I think the, the ASAP Club is one where our students have really demonstrated some, some innovation and some connecting their club to others on campus. Yeah, I think this is a good uh, connection also with what makes us different with some of the projects we have. Um, Sarah alluded that we have another campus facility south of uh, College of Ag campus, the ADM Innovation Center, uh, which is a relatively large uh, shop and fabrication space for students um, and student projects. And in some cases, I have students from other majors um, and they come down there as a senior if they do a capstone that I that they help with other uh, majors as well. And they're like, wow, I can't believe you have this on campus and your students get to do this. And it's that experience in some of the projects that also set our students apart and gives them that opportunity to differentiate themselves um, and set them up for a, a, just a great career. But three that I'll highlight are very different in application, but common in some of the attributes. So we have a, a PUP team, which is a Purdue Utility Project, which is housed out of Ag and Bioengineering. I've been the advisor for uh, 10 or 12 years. Um, we went the first eight years to Cameroon and the last two years to Kenya. Um, unfortunately, it got canceled and we're going to miss this year. Um, and it's um, primarily ag engineering students, machine systems, but then also mechanical materials, electrical. We've had College of Ag students on there, so it's a multidisciplinary um, group. That's high tech design, but for development situations and applications. And so, again, the students are using the same cutting edge design skills that they're learning in their classes, but designing appropriate tools and uh, mechanization options for smallholder farmers, in this case in Africa. Um, there's also data analysis. So one of our recent projects is a data acquisition systems where we can monitor the vehicles from a computer on Purdue's campus to see what they're doing globally and keep track of data and make logistics planning for a business as a delivery system for the vehicles that are in the different countries where we're in. Um, so again, so it looks like it's a pretty low tech vehicle, but there's actually high tech engineering going into it. Then you have quarter scale, which is our ASABE, one of our student, the student club that Sarah mentioned, and those students get a chance to design from scratch, build a tractor. It's similar to the SAE projects um, that, that uh, Mechanical would do. So the industry sponsors those uh, teams. Um, they do design, build, compete. They have to give oral and written presentations to the judges. Uh, and again, last two years, um, we did an all-electric tractor with an electric driveline kind of cognizant of where a lot of things are moving in agriculture and robotics. And so, again, the students learn high-tech skills. It's a very organized competition. We compete against 20 or 30 other schools each year, primarily uh, agricultural engineering schools from around the country. Uh, Canada and Israel has sent some teams as well. And then the last team is uh, AgBot or AgroBot now, which Purdue hosted the competition. And that one by nature is a pretty high tech and you assume it by the name. So basically taking an autonomous vehicle, being able to drive it through the field. In our case, the competition they chose was to identify one of three types of weeds and either mechanically kill the weed or spray it with one of the three types of uh, chemicals to kill that weed. So you can imagine right now, if we go through a field and we spray it with an aerial application, an airplane or a sprayer, we more or less blanket the field. We can change the application rates, but the, the plants and the weeds, all the plants in the field are getting essentially the same application. But now if we go through and we can actually just give a squirt of chemical or mechanically knock out the weed, A, we're reducing the uh, application of chemicals tremendously, but we're also disturbing the soil less and the benefits environmentally. And so those are good examples of projects that are um, housed out of uh, ABE that we have great lab facilities for it um, and that we, we also have other students work on uh, campus on there, but it's fun. I think that was one of the hardest things about this semester is all the student teams and the capstone teams, including our sponsor related ones, are to the point that they come back after spring break and they normally are in that shop a lot working on things and it's, it's quiet and deserted right now, which is 
pretty depressing for instructors and our students to, to take, but um, we'll recover and, and life will go on. All right, so last question for both of you. We've been throwing around terms like agriculture and farms and soil and natural resources. Um, do students have to have a farming background or know about farming to be successful or even interested in uh, any of these programs? I guess I'll get started because I'm not on mute at this point. So, um, so there, there's a sense that um, the image is still out there that yes, you need to have a background in agriculture. But if you look at the population that directly is involved in farming nowadays, it's less than 2% of our population. That's a pretty small group of people that have that image of an agricultural background. Now, agriculture as an industry is, is very large. You know, 20 to 30% of our, in our jobs and stuff have something to deal with agriculture and food production. But in the same way that you wouldn't expect that you needed to be a mechanical engineer before you pick mechanical engineer or have a background in fluids before you go into fluid. I think an interest in the energy, water, food, environment, food production systems, the grand challenges, uh, making a difference. Um, the courses are set up. And I think the fun thing that we're seeing in agriculture is there's more recognition. It's not just about traditional farming where you see a tractor out in the field. That is high tech and changing as well. But you have indoor um, farming, you have agro, um, hydroponics, you got mixed integration farming systems, you got autonomous farming systems. There's a lot of high tech stuff going on in agriculture that's not traditional agriculture or sitting in a tractor driving a tractor anymore. It's really data management, data decision making, robotics, um, how to interact with um, all the different sensors and data protecting our environment. Um, it, it's, it's just a really fun time to be in agriculture. There's an image out of agriculture engineering that's pretty inaccurate and pretty old, but it, but if you look at the stuff going on in ag engineering right now, it's just an incredible time. I mean, it's, if I, I feel if I don't read something every day, I'm going to get behind my, myself on, on the changes in agriculture, which tells you how rapidly and exciting the field is.